Thank you all very, very much for coming. I hope you're not too hot on the outside of the tent. Um, this is going to be a terrific hour, and I can tell that the fact that there's so many of you here, you really want to hear George's argument on this subject. And George, <laughs> thank you very, very much indeed for coming. Uh, I won't say what that might imply, but anyway, thank you for coming. You may find a small amount of opposition to some of your more radical theories. But George, in my view, has always been one of our most important thinkers about politics, about ideas, and about systems. And I couldn't be more happy that he's turned his extraordinary brain towards the question of the food system in his new book, Regenesis, um, which lots of you have bought in the last hour while he has been signing. Regenesis is a fantastic read. You may not agree with all of it, but it certainly sets up some questions which everyone needs to think about as we try to fix our falling apart world food system, which everyone here at Groundswell wants to do. So George, a really, um, first of all, thank you, of course, for being here. And let's start with the thing that's in a way at the bottom of Groundswell, which is, of course, the soil, which is, in a way, what this festival started about, to make people understand that what's beneath our feet is certainly not just a bunch of dirt. So it is, I think, the most underappreciated ecosystem on Earth. In fact, large numbers of people don't even recognize it as an ecosystem. For years, we've been treating it like dirt. But it turns out that not only is it as abundant and diverse as any coral reef or rainforest, but the whole thing, like a coral reef, is a biological structure. It is constructed by the organisms that live in it. Um, and at the smaller scale, you've got bacteria using the carbon in the soil as polymers to stick together the mineral particles and to make the capsules, the microaggregates in which they live. And these have almost magical properties. So even when you air dry soil, um, the uh, uh, bacterial capsule will have 98% humidity inside it because that's the habitat that it's created for itself. And then out of those microaggregates, the very small microarthropods, the little scuttling creatures in the soil, make slightly bigger ones. And then the giants of the soil, like your ants and earthworms, they make bigger ones still out of those mesoaggregates. And what you end up with is a structure that's fractally scaled. In other words, it has the same structure, whatever magnification you look at it, which helps to explain, in the state of nature, soil's extraordinary structural resilience, why it doesn't just get swept away by wind or by rain. But I think the most exciting properties to come to light recently are uh, concern the interaction between plants and microbes mm -hmm. in the soil. Um, and you know, soil ecology is, I, I think, as a biologist, one of the most exciting um, areas in the whole field at the moment because it's moving so fast and we're discovering so much so rapidly. And I think a lot of these discoveries will inform a whole new agriculture, which I know some people here are already beginning to practice. Some people here are well ahead of these discoveries. But I think we can use some of the new findings to inform new practices and particularly this extraordinary relationship. Because, well, I think for me, the transformative finding is that plants dump up to 40% of all the sugars that they make through photosynthesis into the soil. And before dumping those sugars, they turn some of them into, complex, uh, into compounds of tremendous complexity with massive chemical names. And it looks at first sight like pouring money down the drain. What are they doing? Mm -hmm. you know, why are they putting all this energy, all this expenditure into making all this stuff and then pouring it into the ground. Well, it turns out that those very complex chemicals are their communication system. Plants can talk. They talk to the microbes in the soil, particularly to bacteria. And they use those very complex chemicals to wake up particular bacterial species. They don't want to wake up all the bacteria. Some of them will do them harm. Bacteria tend to exist in a state of limbo until they receive the right signal. They want to wake up particular species, even particular genetic types within those species. That's how precise this signaling is. And they'll use those very complex compounds to say, hello, wake up, the root has arrived in this lump of soil, it's, 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 it's time for a banquet, and then they will pour sugar into that zone surrounding the root hair, which we call the rhizosphere, and saturate those bacteria with food, the bacteria will then multiply very rapidly. 
And they then do several things. First, they deliver minerals to the plant in exchange for those sugars, but they also produce growth hormones and they create a defensive ring around the root, protecting it from pathogens, but also they fire up the plant's immune system. So even if it's being attacked above ground by aphids or something on the leaves, um, the plant will signal to bacteria, the bacteria will bounce the signal back, and that fires up the immune system. It seems clunky, but that's the way it's evolved. When you put all that together, a bell starts ringing in the back of your head. Haven't I seen this before? Isn't there something like this somewhere in the back of my mind? Oh, yes, the human gut. Mm -hmm. It's exactly what's happening in the human gut. Um, and when you s discover, moreover, that out of the thousand or so phyla of bacteria, there are four phyla used by plants and by humans, exactly the same four phyla, to perform these functions, which are specialists in symbiosis, um, you see that what we're looking at here, the rhizosphere, is in effect the plant's external gut. And that's the hot zone in the soil. That's where all the action is. And as we begin to understand what's happening in the plant's external gut, we can radically modify the way we farm. So I want to come back to the radically how we, how we change farming in a minute, but can we just go through the very powerful part of your book where you talk about the global food corporations and in a way that post-war when we started deep plowing without any understanding of what this was, you know, it was a battlefield every day for the soil. It's quite remarkable that it hung on as long as it did in a lot of cases and managed to repair. But the then addition of chemicals and where we've got to now that has become so damaging. So... <laughs> It's, it's kind of miraculous that any food is still being yeah. produced when you look at uh, when all the impacts beginning to hit the system and the systemic weakness of the system itself. Because in one respect, the greatest problem the global food system faces is the global food system. Now, I read a lot of papers to research this book, o over 5,000 in total, and a lot of them scared the bejesus out of me. But the scariest ones of all were these papers written by scientists going back almost 10 years saying the global food system is beginning to look like the global financial system. It is systemically unstable. It has lost its resilience. And for exactly the same reasons as the global financial system lost its resilience. Now, I, I'm a complex systems fanatic, as you'll probably be, be picking up as, as we go along. Um, uh, my background in ecology um, um, gives me a certain amount of pride in this respect because it was kind of ecologists which discovered complex systems to a large extent. When the chief economist of the Bank of England was asked by the Queen, why didn't anyone see the financial crash coming, he did an inspired thing. He went to my old um, ecology lecturer, not because he was mine, but because, because this was a guy, Robert May, who really developed systems thinking and said, what can we learn from ecology? about what's happened to the banks. And they wrote a paper together, a brilliant paper, and then the chief economist, Andy Haldane, made a fantastic speech to the Bank of England explaining what, what systems theory had to show us about why the banks so nearly collapsed from what looked like a very small disruption, the subprime mortgage crisis in the United States. Not a big deal in terms of the size of financial flows. And what they found was that the problem was the banks had become too big to fail, as we know. And in systems theory terms, that means that the nodes, the dominant nodes, the sort of the knots in the system, had become too powerful. But they'd also become too strongly linked with each other. And as they each pursued their own efficiencies within the system, they stripped out the spare capacity, the redundancy in that system. Efficiency is great for any individual player within it. All, all those efficiencies combined are disastrous in systemic terms. Their behavior began to synchronize through means that the regulators scarcely understood, like derivatives trading, for instance, um, and, and um, debt swaps and all sorts of slightly dodgy and weird things, securitization and the rest of it. And the result was that it took then only a very small perturbation to send that very close to tipping over the edge. In fact, if they hadn't bailed it out worldwide with trillions, the whole thing would have collapsed. And so the scientists looking at the global food system are saying, hang on a moment, 
we've got four corporations controlling 90% of the global grain trade. Their behavior is almost identical, corporation by corporation. They're all doing the same thing. They've all pursued maximum efficiencies. They've stripped the redundancy out of the system. They've stripped the modularity out of the system, which means the degree to which it's compartmentalized. So shocks can then travel, vroom, straight from one side of the system to the other. They've um, stripped the circuit breakers out of the system. They've stripped out the backup systems. So this means that it takes only a relatively small perturbation, potentially, to bring the whole thing down. And we know that governments were able to bail out the banks because they could draw on future money, right? But you can't bail out the food system with future food. Now, when you combine this with several other observations, one, the world has polarized into super exporters and super importers. So for any major commodity, you're talking about five um, major exporters pretty well mopping that commodity up. When you consider that two of those, in several cases, are Russia and Ukraine, you can see how, how much of a problem we're in. Um, a lot of that food, a very large proportion of the globally traded food, goes through a number of choke points, such as the Panama Canal, the Suez Canal. We saw what happened to that last year when a giant ship got stuck, stuck across it. The Bab al-Mandab, the Straits of Hormuz, the Straits of Malacca, the Turkish Straits, which are effectively closed now because of Russia's invasion with the, uh, of, of Ukraine. As global trade has been so-called harmonized, has become frictionless, which was meant to improve our food supplies, the corporations have gone, oh, hang on a moment, we don't need to keep reserves anymore. We can switch to a just-in-time system from stocks to flow. So basically our food reserves are floating at sea in container ships. So you can see it doesn't take much of a disruption to break that food chain. And the disruptions are now coming thick and fast. We've seen a major geopolitical disruption recently, Ukraine. Um, when that happened, the Indian government stepped up and said, don't worry, we've got a great wheat harvest on the way. We'll, fill, um, we'll, we'll, we'll fulfill that shortfall, um, and we're going to become a super exporter this year. A month later, they said, uh, about those exports, uh, we've just had a huge heat wave, the grain has shriveled, um, and we're imposing a total export ban. And then... You, so that was a climate shock hitting a geopolitical shock. We're going to see a lot more of that going on. Since 2015, something extremely disturbing and really bizarre has been taking place, which is that the long-running trend from the 1960s until 2014 of global chronic hunger declining turned and it began to rise again. It defied all the predictions. But what was really weird about it was that that happened just at a point when global food prices took a massive dive. The global food price index went from 115 in 2014 to 93 in 2015. And it stayed below 100 right up until 2021. So you'd think, great, bonanza time, fantastic. Everyone gets fed. Any economist would say, this is amazing. Every, everyone will have, uh, the, the, you know, we'll get rid of chronic hunger because the price has fallen so far. But throughout that time, chronic hunger was rising. So what's going on? What this is a clear sign of is systemic instability. Because what's been happening is that relatively small shocks have been transmitted very effectively across this system that's lost its redundancy, its modularity, its circuit breakers, its backup systems. Right? And those shocks aren't felt by us in the rich nations with hard currencies. You know, if, if, a, if one exporter puts some export restrictions on or if um, there's a speculative surge in a particular commodity, we don't really feel it. It all gets evened out. But it's the poor nations with the weak currencies which get hit by it. And so even while the global food price is low, they get f local and national food spikes, price spikes, because they're at the end of that chain and the shocks have been transmitted down that chain. So that's why we're seeing chronic hunger rising. And when you get the increased transmission of shocks like that, in other words, a, a fluctuation of outputs from the system, that's a clear sign that that system is approaching its tipping point. It's very much the case with the financial system. We saw these weird surges and declines in equity values up to the point where Northern Rock collapsed. Mm -hmm. Then it got worse up to the point where Lehman Brothers collapsed. And then we were hours away from total systemic collapse. Now, the really frightening thing about this 
is that those papers I was reading, going back almost 10 years, were completely ignored by almost everyone, by policymakers, by governments, by the media. They got no play at all. Those scientists, it was as if they were behind a pane of, of plate glass, banging their hands on the glass, mouths opening and closing. No one could hear what they were saying. And is that where you think we're going now? What do you think will actually happen? Well, the trouble with tipping points in a, in a complex system is you don't know when you've reached them until you've reached until them. You, reach them. You, you can't predict exactly when they're going to come, but you sure as hell know when they have okay. come. So, so whichever way we look at it, if you, if you couple in the health statistic, you know, in that the leading cause of death and ill health is now diet, we are at a tipping point in terms of creating a new system. I mean, that's why we're all here. So you have very radical ideas about how this new system should be going forward. Do you want to start to lay them out? Um, sure. Thanks, Rosie. So, so I've divided it into three compartments, really, arable, horticulture, and protein and fat. Um, and I mean, there's lots of innovation, as you all know, in all of those areas, and some of it, I think, is very exciting. So I'm just going to select one or two snapshots of, of things which have attracted my attention here. And in Arable, while there's a, a lot of promising ways forward, I think the most exciting of all is perennial grains. And some of you will be aware of the work of the Land Institute based in Salina, Kansas, and some of its partner organisations around the world, um, I, I know that we've got um, someone, Lennart, here who's, who's working with them. Um, and they have basically managed to crack a, an ambition which um, scientists have been pursuing for over a century, which is to breed perennial grain crops. Now, nearly all the grains that we eat today, as you know, come from annual plants, plants that live and die within one year. And annual plants in the state of nature large areas covered by them are pretty rare. They only happen, really, in the wake of a disaster, a landslide, a fire, a volcanic eruption. And the annuals, they're pioneer species. They can move in very quickly. They seed quickly. They can occupy the ground very fast. And then the perennials come in and drown them out, and that's the end of the annuals. And so in, in order to grow annual crops, we have to create a disaster every year, right? We have to clear the land, either by plowing it or by spraying it, we have to get rid of the perennials which might be living there, all the competing annuals. And we have to get those, um, th those annual um, seedlings a lot of help to get going. We have to feed them a lot. We have to kill, kill the competitors which might come up. Um, and, and all that takes a lot of intervention. And that intervention tends to be harmful to nature. They need a lot more irrigation than a lot of perennial, uh, a lot of perennial species need. Uh, they're very susceptible to pests. Um, du during those their, their salad days, um, their, their their early days, and so and, and so there's a whole load of ways in which um, our um, annual crop habit, which quite understandably arose because annual plants they seed very easily, they get big seeds by comparison to the. I beg your pardon. They don't feed the soil. No, no. And the other issue with them is they're very susceptible to to environmental shocks. Um, so, um, for instance, the Land Institute has, um, is developing some perennial sunflowers, um, and they were growing them beside annual sunflowers. They got a heavy drought, a major drought, completely wiped out the annuals, and the perennials just sailed straight through. And the reason for this is they had much deeper roots, much bigger roots further down, and tougher structures above ground. I mean, so perennials on so the whole are much So would you say, though, that we have become uh, a, a world growing annuals purely because of the way the food system works, because this is how people make money, or is there another reason? Well, we've been doing it since the Neolithic. You know, it's, 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 got, it's got deep roots, deeper than the actual plants. Um, but, and, and, you know, there are good reasons why we chose them. You know, they do have these characteristics of big seeds, mm -hmm. um, quick growth, you know, they quickly reach maturity, um, particularly for the sort of the much more sort of labile farming which was done early on, they were very necessary, and we just didn't have good substitutes. You know, it's taken a lot of scouring the world to find substitutes and breeding, quick breeding, to 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 get to the point where we can develop perennial crops. And they'll have the same kind of yield. Yeah, well, that's the whole thing. So, so the 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 key is to get to that yield, and they've done it uh, completely. Uh, they've got all the way 
with a rice variety called PR23, developed with Yunnan University, where it's now fully commercialised in southern China, and farmers are biting their hands off to get the yeah. seeds, partly because it's, there's much less soil erosion, and soil erosion, particularly in Yunnan, is a really big issue. Terraces slipping off the hillsides and stuff. But mostly, I suspect, because there's a real labour shortage there. The young people have moved to the cities. And so if you can um, just keep the same plants in the ground and keep harvesting them, you've cut your labour right down. And they've now harvested the same plant six times and they've got the same yield still as annual rice. It doesn't last forever. I mean, eventually you'll have to replace them. We don't know how long that'll be, but so far they've held up very well. So they're now they're bringing on perennial wheat, perennial uh, wheat grass, which is a different species, but it's sort of quite similar characteristics to wheat, barley, sorghum, pulses of various kinds. There's a whole lot of crops in the pipeline. And... I think it's thrilling. I think it's very exciting. We can greatly reduce our impacts while maintaining yields, which is which is the holy grail. That, that's what we, you know, it's high yield, low impact is what I'm looking for all the way through this book. Okay, on with the next one. So um, horticulture, um, again, lots of really interesting innovation in this area. Um, the, the the system I was. I've become most fascinated by is the one pursued by um, Ian Tolhurst, Tolly, in South Oxfordshire, um, where for 34 years he's been um, growing vegetables and a bit of fruit on some pretty crap land. It's grade 3B, 40% stone, um, very susceptible to drying out. Uh, but he's managed to do it all this time without um, using any fertilizer or any manure. Um, he's developed what he calls stock-free organic or veganics, um, and and he's done so pretty well by anticipating some of these new developments in soil ecology. Um, and what he seems to have done, and you know his systems being studied, we don't, you know, his sort of practice is ahead of the theory in some ways. We don't fully understand why it works, but he he seems to have mediated the relationship between plants and microbes in a very successful way. Um, so he's managed throughout this time steadily to raise yields and to raise soil fertility, partly with the help of green manures, with, 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 with you know, deep roots bringing up subsoils from the bottom, uh, uh, minerals from the subsoil, um, partly through keeping the soil covered at all times um, because his soil is highly susceptible to leaching, um, and so if you don't keep it covered, you just lose all your minerals. But then about, what is it, 12 or 13 years ago now, he had a bit of a breakthrough, which was when he started adding um, a, an average of a millimetre of wood chip per, per year to his, his green manures. And, and from that point on, his yields doubled, and his soil fertility and worm count and everything began to rise very quickly indeed. And what he seems to have done is to just tweak that relationship between the plants and the, the bacteria and the fungi. Now, an aerated soil, being an ecosystem, seeks an equilibrium state. And in an aerated, or in other words, agricultural soil, um, one aspect of that equilibrium state is a carbon to nitrogen ratio of roughly 12 to 1. And one hypothesis for what he's been doing is he's been keeping the soil in that sweet spot. In that, in that equilibrium state, which then allows the bacteria in particular to interact um, as, as fully as possible with the plants and deliver the minerals they need when they need them, in other words, mineralization, but also, and just as importantly, to lock the minerals up when the plants don't need them, in other words, immobilization. And it seems that immobilization is as important as mineralization. Because if you're not immobilizing nutrients when plants aren't, aren't using them, you lose those nutrients. And you know, we know that we lose well over 50% of all the nitrates supplied to the soil and over 80% of all the phosphates supplied to the soil. And not only is this a huge cost to farmers, it's a massive environmental issue as well. I mean, we have basically the eutrophication of earth systems going on. We've seen how the global standard farm delivering the global standard diet, is producing the global standard river, over-fertilized, hostile to almost all life forms, right? And that's then creating global standard dead zones at sea, 
um, where you've just got a massive microbe ecology and nothing else going on because the microbes have killed everything else off because they've been over-fertilized there as well. Uh, we see nitrous oxide, a very powerful greenhouse gas, being produced in huge quantities through the over-nitrogenization of the system. Um, it's just a whole stack of problems. And when you look at the planetary boundaries diagrams, you'll see nitrates and phosphates exceeding the planetary boundary more than any other human impact on Earth. So this notion of immobilizing surplus minerals is absolutely crucial ecologically as well as agronomically. And, and so if we can start developing systems like Tollies, which can both mineralize at the right time and immobilize at the right time, then we're a long way down the road to where we need to be. But, I mean, it's not, it's not easy. You know, like, like a lot of people here, he works a, a, a seven-day week, you know, a 12-hour day, uh, makes very little money, like most horticulturalists do. You know, it's a very tough business. Some people have been able to replicate his system with success. Others haven't. We don't know why yet. And the reason is we don't know enough about what's going on under our feet. It's so massively understudied. You know, we have very crude soil mapping, very poor soil condition knowledge, uh, very poor soil ecology knowledge. And we just need massively to ramp that up. And if we're going to replicate systems like Tolly's, we need to do that as quickly okay. as possible. So replicating Tolly's system is obviously... A, going to take quite a long time, and also, it seems to me, from what I've both read and listened to you, it's never going to happen on a massive scale. It's your third idea that is the one that is both really controversial as well as being something that you say can jump us from one... I mean, it's effectively like saying, today we turn off fossil fuels. Yeah, so, so this, is the, this is the one the livestock farmers love. Um, <laughs> it's the... Uh, but it is, it is the potentially transformative technology. I think the, the most important environmental technology on Earth. You know, if you ask people what's the most important, they might say, or oh, solar panels or wind turbines. I think precision fermentation is the most important environmental technology. And what this means, basically, is brewing, but brewing in quite a sophisticated way. Um, and there are several companies now in this space who are using um, bacteria or archaea or fungi, or algae. There's a lot of different um, techniques being, being tried out, some of which are closer to commercialization than others, um, but basically to produce pretty well something from nothing, particularly when you look at the, um, well, the system I looked at, particularly in Helsinki in Finland, um, um, a form of precision fermentation using hydrogen oxygenating bacteria. So this has no agricultural feedstocks at all, um, it uses no photosynthetic products. Indeed, if this takes off, as I believe it will, it'll be the first major foodstuff humans have ever eaten which doesn't rely on photosynthesis at any point in the food chain. So the, this is a soil bacterium being grown by this company called Solar Foods called uh, Cupria Vidis Necator. It's not a new technology. It was developed by NASA in the 1960s for its space program. Um, but the idea of general commercialization is new, and they're breeding these bacteria, basically brewing them uh, in a similar way that you would brew brewer's yeast or yeast for bread making um, or for insulin produ production um, or, or for, um, um, uh, for, for, uh, uh, for, for rennet production um, in, in, in vats and producing, well, just yeah, dried, dead bacteria, which looks like flour. It's a sort of golden-coloured flour because it's got beta-carotene in more importantly, it's 60% protein, 30% fat, and you can turn it into just about anything. So I was the first person outside the lab to eat a pancake made from this flour, a small flip for man. And the bizarre thing was that it tasted just like a pancake. We had to dilute it with wheat flour, otherwise we would have made an omelet. You know, if you're making a normal pancake, you add protein and fat to your wheat flour um, to make it succulent. But in this case, because it was already 60% protein, 30% flat, you had, to, you had to use the wheat flour to bring that content down to make a pancake. But they're not just in the business of making pancakes. Um, through a whole series of new techniques, you can make pretty well any protein or fat-based product. And you can do it with a tiny fraction of the land footprint, the water footprint, 
the nutrient footprint, you're talking about absolutely minimizing the means by which we can make the protein and fat on which many of the okay. world's people depend. All right. Okay. You, you started off this conversation by talking about the soil and making the analogy between the soil and the gut and also saying that both of these studies, this science, is very new. How on earth can you be confident then that something that is brewed in a lab is going to supply the human with the right kind of stuff that the human has been devouring for centuries? Sure. So, I mean, everything has to go through regulatory approval before it, it goes anywhere. Well, and at the moment, there. Yes, no, no, it's second, kind of no, more no, than that. Yes, I know. There's several steps. So, we need to know exactly what we're dealing with. You know, no, no one's, apart from people like me, no one's going to eat this stuff until it's, it's gone through the system. But we know it's got all nine essential amino acids. Um, it's basically got, it's, it's pretty well in terms of protein digestibility, more or less halfway between animal and, and plant protein. Um, it's it's very similar to um, the profile of many of the other foodstuffs we eat. Um, it has one issue, which is a quite a high level of nucleic acids. So uh, those need to be removed before um, it, it goes into the human food chain because they can cause gout, kidney stones, and stuff like that. But again, that's just standard food technology. That, 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 that happens in, in other parts of the food chain already. I mean, there's nothing... Uh, nutritionally weird about this stuff it's it is you know very similar to to a lot of other stuff we eat but it comes from a different place not an entirely different place because we eat loads of bacteria already you know we deliberately introduce bacteria into a great deal of our food stuff like yogurt or cheese for example and in that case it's live not dead bacteria like this how do you get the flavor well so you can either breed the flavor because you know the bacteria are highly susceptible to horizontal gene transfer, gene editing, selective breeding, which can give you pretty well any balance you're looking for, or you introduce the flavour. But you know at the moment, if you're looking, for instance, at plant-based substitutes for meat, they're pretty unsatisfactory, because they they tend to have a lot long list of ingredients, right? Because you need to partly because you need to disguise the plant-based fats which go into them, which aren't great. You know, they're greasy rather than juicy, a lot of coconut used, a lot of soya used, and, and so you're adding all this stuff to make it palatable to people. If you were to use this um, for your meat-based substitutes instead, you're talking about a far shorter list of ingredients because you're not having to cover all those unsatisfactory ingredients especially if you then start looking at potential hybrid systems, like, for instance, introducing encapsulated fats into it. I mean, one of the reasons why plant-based meat substitutes are greasy is that the fats are loose, whereas in meat, the fats are mm -hmm. within animal cell membranes. Now, I'm, I've become a cultured meat sceptic. I, I don't believe it's going to happen. I, but when I started research for the book, I thought it would. Uh, but um, I think there's just too too much complexity, too much trouble there. But also, I think it's entirely unnecessary because by introducing elements of what has been developed towards full cultured meat, you can actually bring in everything you need without having to go the whole hog of breeding a lamb chop in a, in a, in a, in a test tube, effectively. Um, and encapsulated fats is relatively easy. You can introduce that in... Um, you can introduce some of the innovations that, for instance, um, the Beyond Burger people have brought in. Um, and you're getting pretty close then to, well, a much better meat substitute than we've got at the moment. But I think we're going to go beyond that very quickly. And just as the agricultural revolution in the Neolithic introduced foodstuffs mm -hmm. that people weren't even imagining, like, you know, the first farmers to capture a wild cow weren't thinking of camembert, right? We're going to have a whole flourishing of new foodstuffs we can't even imagine at this stage. So what's to stop this becoming like a Silicon Valley and we end up with Amazon, Google, yeah. you know, we end up no, with Cargill exactly. and Archer Daniels Well, that's all exactly over again. the right question. That is exactly the right question because you know, one thing I realised in doing all this research is the problem is not the technology, regardless of what you're looking at. Even if it's sort of, you know, your straightforward farming technologies, it's the ownership of the technology which counts. So if we look at grain production, you know, there's nothing, nothing um, novel or weird about producing grain, right? But it's been captured 
by a tiny number of corporations. You know, 90% of grain trade in the hands of four large companies, which is a huge threat to human welfare and indeed to planetary systems and indeed to the food system itself. So the issue here is who owns it and what are the terms of their ownership? And in every single field, whether it's Amazon or Google or whether it's Cargill or Archer Daniels Midland or whether it's Solar Foods or any of the other new companies moving into this area, two fundamental principles should apply. Intellectual property laws should be weak and antitrust laws should be strong. Now, the problem we've got as a planet is it's been exactly the other way around. Mm -hmm. We've stripped out the antitrust laws. They scarcely exist anymore. We've got monopolies almost everywhere. And we've allowed these huge, well, huge intellectual property rights to pile up and pile up through mergers and acquisitions, allowing corporations to put a padlock on the food chain, right? And so at the beginning of any new technology, we've got to come in at the ground floor and say, this must be open source. It's essential this is open source. So instead of throwing rocks at the technology, which I think has been the sort of default mode of some people, you say, no, you know, we... Where, where it can help us, we embrace it. Where it can harm us, we push it away. But the key thing is we've got to get in there and say this has got to belong to us. That's the crucial issue here. But not just here. Right across the food chain, it is a crucial issue. I agree, and I think it's an extremely difficult one too. But we're not going to go there. We could stay there for the next year. Um, obviously, if this, uh, this works, we're not going to be eating any meat or real meat as we know it. Um, obviously this is a, I mean no one is going to disagree with you about the 80 billion farmed animals that are currently in cages, um, chickens, beef, pork, um, no one wants that kind. But there's a strong argument that grazing, uh, mob grazing, the kind of grazing that's pract practiced here at this farm is not only uh, good for the wildlife, good for the regeneration, good for climate, good for preserving nature. Indeed, there's a lot of experiments that have gone on, um, Alan Savory, etc., that you can see that cattle in nice limited commodities can help and enhance the environment and the biodiversity. And yet you say, end of. Yeah, I mean, not entirely the end of all livestock, because I see a value in genuinely regenerative systems and conservation grazing for very particular habitats which you're trying to preserve. But I've also seen this word regenerati regenerative become a bit like the word sustainable, mm -hmm. that it kind of gets slapped onto almost anything. So I think of it often as um, regenerative grazing, formerly known as grazing. Um, what do you mean by and regenerative? So, What's your idea? So from my point of view, uh, you know, as someone with a background in ecology... Regenerative must mean ecologically regenerative, right? And for me, the minimum standard for ecological regeneration is trees returning to a formerly wooded landscape, which is most of the UK, right? There's very little of the UK which wouldn't have had trees. I'm not saying continuous cover everywhere. Um, some parts would have been closed canopy forests. Some parts would have been wood pasture. But if we're going to look about at ecological regeneration, that means that trees have to be allowed to come back and that means very low stocking levels so we've seen at NEP what that means in terms of stocking levels their total meat production is 54 kilos of meat per hectare per year which is really tiny in the uplands um, we we haven't seen we don't have a direct study with sheep but there's a good proxy with deer that for uh, deer managers find uh, to get trees back, you have to bring your deer down to about four or five per square kilometre or, or below. And that means one per 20 hectares. So we're talking about very, very low numbers of, of, of livestock in what I would consider a genuinely regenerative system. Now, if that's the only way in which we're going to produce our meat, and, uh, and I think you know, in, in my, in, in my worldview it would be, then we're talking about very, very little meat being produced. We're talking about basically meat being an extremely rare and expensive commodity. Now, as for the question about you know, re, re, what is often called regenerative grazing, um, the issue here is the amount of land. So I talked earlier about the importance of high-yield farming. 
And the reason why I think high yield farming and you know the holy grail is high yield, low impact farming is so important is that every hectare of land we use for one thing is a hectare of land we can't use for another thing. Not, not, certainly not in its full state. So, for instance, even the kindest and gentlest forms of agriculture, if you're going to be extracting anything from it in terms of food, requires a radical simplification of ecosystems. And it favours certain species, no question at all, but it disfavours many other species. And in fact, the great majority of the world's species require no extractive industry at all. And they require wild ecosystems like forests, like wetlands, like savannas, like natural grasslands, unfenced, un unstock managed and the rest of it, with large predators and all the rest of it in order to thrive. And every hectare we use for low yield farming, and a lot of what's called regenerative farming is low yield farming, is a hectare which isn't going to be used for wild ecosystems and a hectare which eats into those wild ecosystems even further than a hectare of high yield farming would do. Now, I'm not an absolutist when it comes to sparing versus sharing because I can see there are definitely benefits for sharing as well, but sharing within a largely high yield system. So your beetle banks and, and your, your um, uh, you know, um, agroforestry rows and stuff like that within a high yield system absolutely is a good thing to do. And we need corridors and stepping stones for wildlife which lives in the, the protected reserves of wild ecosystems to be able to move through a farm landscape. But if we're going to turn the whole farm landscape into low yield production, then we're just going to have to increase the land area. And already, low-yield farming is by far and away the greatest human land take on Earth. So a lot of us campaign, quite rightly, against urban sprawl, right? We hate urban sprawl. It's bad for the countryside and it's bad for cities. And we're right to campaign against it. But urban areas occupy just 1% of the planet's surface. Agriculture occupies 40% of the planet's surface, which is pretty well all the planet that can be farmed except for nature reserves and forests, right? We don't want to start intruding on them. The rest of it is mostly desert, ice cap, um, rocky soil and the rest of it, places which can't be farmed. Okay, of that 40%, right, 12% of the planet's surface is under crops, some of which are grown to um, feed humans, um, uh, but a high proportion of which, around 30%, are grown to feed animals, right? So wh where's the rest of it? That 28% of the land surface, far more than is used for arable farming, that's used for pasture, for grazing livestock. This is an incredibly profligate way of using land. Land that could otherwise be used to stop the sixth great extinction. If that land were rewilded, if that land became wild ecosystems, if the forests were to return, if the wetlands were to return, the savannas were to return, we could stop the collapse of our ecosystems in their tracks. We could prevent planetary breakdown. We could also help prevent climate breakdown because as those ecosystems recover, they draw down much of the carbon dioxide we've already released into the air. And we now know that we've left it too late merely to decarbonize our economies. Obviously, we have to decarbonize them as quickly as possible. But sadly, people like me have been ignored for the past 30 years saying, we need to do it now, we need to do it now. We now left it too late. Even if we were to remove all the fossil fuels, leave them all in the ground, we would still definitely exceed 1.5 degrees of heating and probably 2 degrees. So we have to go further than that and draw down some of the carbon we've already released and by far the quickest, cheapest, easiest and most benign way of doing that is through the restoration of ecosystems. As the trees come back, as the wetlands come back, they draw down far more soil. Now, Alan Savory and co. will say, oh, no, we're doing that already with, with our pastures. They're storing carbon. Well, there's a scientific term for his claims, which has been applied, actually, by several scientists I've seen. Bullshit. I'm afraid they just do not stack up. Even Ted... The TED, you know, he gave this famous TED talk that had 11 million views. Even they, who are extremely reluctant ever to challenge their own speakers, have now put an advisory warning on his speech because it does not stand up. So I, I set out to read every single paper 
and an article which the Savory Institute was promoting and all the other papers I could get my hands on in this entire space. And there is simply no evidence of any pastured system anywhere even washing its own face in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, let alone making a net contribution to dealing with climate breakdown. Now, look, for everyone's sake here, you know, including the livestock farmers, you know, we can't afford to be led down a blind alley. You know, if you're investing in a system which is, which is built on sand, where people are going to turn around in a few years and say, sorry, but actually, you know, you, you've sold this on a false premise, that is not going to be sustainable, even economically, let alone ecologically and in climate terms. You know, we, we have to burst the bubble of delusion in which so many particularly foodies live. You know, there's a whole sort of gastro-porn culture in this country. We've gone from being totally indifferent to food to totally obsessed with food in the course of one generation, right? And we have this sort of storybook gastro-porn idea that, you know, we can get our food from these low-yield systems, and everyone can be fed, often promoted by very wealthy people, you know, who can afford to eat very expensive food from low-yield systems. But we cannot feed the world this way. And already now, we're encountering a global food crisis. You know, people are saying, oh, we've got a global food crisis because of the invasion of Ukraine. It's been there since 2015. What Ukraine has done is to reveal the crisis, not to create the crisis. And it's only going to get worse. And we desperately need to develop the high-yield ways of food production which are going to feed people and to challenge the existing system, to bring back the redundancy, the modularity, the backup systems, the circuit breakers, which this global food system now lacks. And I know that a lot of the food sovereignty and food, food justice people really hate the idea of precision fermentation. But I believe it has far more potential to deal with the issues of food sovereignty and food security above all than, 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 than low-yield farming does. Because especially in many of these super, super importer nations, nations in North Africa, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in the Middle East, which are now totally dependent on buying food with soft currencies on a hard currency market from super exporters on the other side of the world making them fantastically vulnerable they have loads of sunlight and sunlight means hydrogen and hydrogen means you can feed hydrogen oxygenating bacteria right here right now on the spot every town could have a brewery outside it producing the protein and fat resources that that town needs and turning it into the foodstuffs matched to the local market this is a far more effective way of ensuring that people are fed, fed well, fed cheaply, than the system that we currently have. Well, on that um, triumphant note, I open the floor to questions. Now, the first one thing is that I have to repeat the question because of the microphone, so please make them short. And also, there's lots of hands. I'll start over there, so please keep it short. Yeah. Say no, we need it, but we're actually really important for keeping things like the gut microbiome. So really okay. my question is, do we risk introducing the same sort of systemic instability that you're describing yeah. with the food system into our diet? Okay. All right. Do we risk introducing the same problems in this new system, no, which I think you partly answered, but... Yeah. Um, I mean, it's an entirely, it's a very good and entirely valid question. And of course, we have always to challenge every system, both old and new, all the time. And, and yeah, it's a question we constantly need to be asking. I mean, at the moment, nothing has come up which gives any cause for alarm. Humans have always eaten a very wide range of stuff. Plants and animals of all kinds, including insects and fish, every part of the viscera of animals... Um, fungi, uh, you know, a really vast amount of stuff, including bacteria. You know, we eat loads and loads of bacteria. They're in every meal you eat. 
sometimes deliberately introduced, but always accidentally introduced. Now, if we raise the bacterial content or the microbial content, the fungal content, the algal content, the archaea content of our diet, will that have drastic effects on human nutrition? Well, it's highly unlikely, but it's always a possibility, and so that possibility needs constantly to be checked and investigated. And we need every single aspect of the food system to be properly regulated and properly monitored. That's absolutely the case. But there is, yeah, you raise the possibility of something going wrong down the line. It's a possibility. But the possibility of something going wrong down the line with the existing system is not a possibility. It's not a probability. It's an absolute certainty. Okay. Thank you. Oh, Tommy. Okay. Okay. Basically, is is your vision much too narrow? Because yeah, sure. So, 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 yeah, finger on the pulses. Thank you. Very important question again. Can't we do this with peas and beans, basically? Can't we? And lentils. Can't we do this with, with, with pulses? Now, look, um, as, as a vegan, and I became a vegan because of the stuff I was finding out, um, I eat a great deal of pulses, as my partner complains all the time. Right? Um, and uh, some of them need a little modification, I think. But, um, and I would love everybody else to. You know, I mean, I think pulses are fantastic in all sorts of ways, a highly uh, a versatile, adaptable food stuff. There's loads and loads of different kinds. They've got a lot of fantastic flavors. You can make a huge range of dishes with them if you know how to cook, which is a big issue. You know, I've got a pressure cooker. I love cooking, and, and that um, means that, you know, I can cook a very wide range of stuff with it. I've got a kitchen as well, which I think it's now, what is it, 12% of British people don't have. Um, that. I would love everybody to have my diet, just as probably everyone in this room wants everybody to have their diet, whatever it happens to be. And we're all in danger of falling into the missionary position, so to speak, of, of saying, you should be like me, you should have my diet. And, you know, people like me have been promoting this diet, which is very rich in pulses, for a very long time. And slowly, slowly, more people are taking it up, but it's super slow. And at the same time, world meat eating is doing this. You know, people go on about the population crisis and they say the human population this. Well, human population is growing at 1% a year, right? The livestock population is growing at 2.4% a year. To put it in crude terms, by 2050, there'll be 100 million tons of extra human on Earth and uh, 400 million tons of extra livestock on Earth. This is a real environmental catastrophe. That's the one we have to address. And frankly, much as I would love it to be the case, most people aren't going to follow my diet. They aren't going to be using their pressure cooker to cook pulses. They're not going to be making dolls and all the other amazing things you can make. They want food which is easily deliverable, very often which doesn't even need cooking at all because unfortunately, much as many of us hate it, that is the way things are going. And they want readily available substitutes for meat which are cheap and are like meat. I don't like that. It's not the stuff I eat. It's not the stuff I'd like to eat. But that is where it is. And, you know, we can fight that, but we're not going to get very far. So we need both. I'm not anti-pulses by any means at all, but they're not going to do it by themselves. Okay, George, I want to fit in some more questions. Okay, thank you for that question. Um, 
I know it's short. tricky, but can you keep your Thank answer you short? Much. Okay, so so Raymond uh, Raymond Williams, a great cultural theorist, said that nature is the most complex la- uh, complex word in the English language, and it's basically because you mean whatever you want it to mean. You know, nature means totally different things to different people, and people doing farming like this, they say, oh, this is nature. Well, yeah, it's it involves nature. Everything we do involves nature. We are nature to an extent. But you can't just say this is and this isn't. You can't say this is pure and this is impure. You can't say this is synthetic food, as someone called it, and this isn't. It's all cultivated. It's all bred. It's all been selected. It's all gone through, in most cases, hundreds of years, thousands of years of selective breeding to turn it into something totally different to what it was in the state of nature. And everything we do that is low yield has a massive impact on wild nature. And in fact, you say, you know, we're farming with nature, we're letting nature take its course. Absolutely the opposite. If you're occupying a very large amount of land to produce food, you're not letting nature take its course. You're taking that land away from wild ecosystems, which I see as the sort of most natural form of nature, if we're going to argue about the word nature. Okay. Okay, okay. I'm going to take one last question because we're right up against time. Well, thank one you for the question. basic... Thank you for that. Oh, oh sorry, did you want to repeat it? No, oh, no, no. no, okay, no, no sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, a basic scientific principle, fundamental to any empirical process, is that we should not be insulted by the facts. Insulted by insults, insulted by abuse, absolutely. But when you try to lay out the facts, you know, try to engage with the facts as facts, not as an insult to you. And I'm trying to lay out the facts as I see them. Now, other people, you might dispute the facts. That's fine. You can dispute the facts. But I'm not coming here to insult you or abuse you or belittle you. Not at all. I try never to do that. I take a lot of abuse, but I don't reciprocate it. I'm trying to lay out a case for a sustainable system. Now, absolutely, I want people to stay on the land. I'm not talking about throwing anyone off the land. If we look at livestock farming, if we look at livestock farming in Wales, it's entirely dependent on the public purse. It's taxpayers who are keeping the farmers on the land. Now, I'm okay with that, but I also think we should have a say in what those farmers are doing if we are paying for it, because there's a fundamental democratic principle there, which is called no taxation without representation. At the moment, we have almost no representation in that area on what subsidies are spent on. I would like to see those subsidies repurposed to encourage farmers in that same situation. That the spe- has he left? Has he, he is, has he gone, unfortunately, yeah. has fired his Parthian shot and gone. Um, I, I would like to see farmers in his situation, and you know, I, I don't in any way you know, regret the fact that he's asked, I just regret the fact that he's left, um, in that situation to do something different, which is to restore ecosystems. And let's face it, you know, the average, the average upland sheep farmer in this country makes minus £16,600 a year from farming sheep. The money comes from filling out subsidy forms. You know, fair enough, we want to keep people on the land, but we want to keep people on the land and make that compatible with a thriving uh, ecosystem which can actually um, allow nature to return, the trees to return, everything that depends on them, and the rest of that system to return, and can stop the sixth great extinction. 
but to pay people out of the public purse to continue doing something which is highly damaging to ecosystems, I believe is a perverse use of public money. And one of my aims in, in writing this book is to say, you know, let's change this system, not against the people who are working the land, but to ensure that they have a sustainable livelihood, a livelihood which is going to survive politically, economically, and ecologically. And that means letting other people have a say too. That means letting the whole country have a say in what happens on that land, rather than a system that I call agricultural hegemony, where only the farmers can decide. Let's all decide this together, but let's ensure that that system also works to keep people on the land, to maintain those communities, to maintain those cultures, while restoring ecosystems. Um, I'm really sorry. I, there's squillions of hands. We have now, I've been given the Time's Up card, so I'm really sorry. But, George, thank you. I mean, you have started a fantastic debate, and you've thrown so many ideas into the mix here that people don't like them, but everyone appreciates you coming.